Our witness of ancient wisdom this morning comes from Matthew 14, verses 22 to 33. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountains by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by, the time, by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking towards them on the lake. But when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me! Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The witness of modern wisdom is Rescue Me by the Reverend Sarah A. Speed. I'd rather not need rescue. I'd prefer a five-step plan and a quick-fix solution, thank you. I'd prefer stubborn insistence over honest vulnerability. Because rescue requires asking for help. Rescue names the rising water. Rescue sees the tired, treading feet. Rescue feels the swell of the wind and the rain at a slant. But when the floor falls out and the world is on fire and my small hands cannot fix the hurt welling in me, the prayer that slips out is rescue, rescue, rescue me. God is still speaking. And we are still listening. Thanks, Thanks be, to be to God. Will you pray with me? Holy God, there are days when the wind is loud. There are days when the rain tears through the trees and the storms of life beg for our attention. So just as you stilled the wind and the sea, still our wandering hearts. Quiet our restless minds. Reach out your hand to us and call us into your word so that we might hear, really hear, your message to us today. With one foot out of the boat, we pray. Amen. Last summer, our family had the privilege of making a trip up to Washington to a place, um, Lake Chelan, it's this beautiful inland lake, and um, on a very hot summer day, we went down to the lake shore, and there was a place where 
Um, there's a dock with enclosed swimming there. I don't know if any of you have ever been there. But um, nearby, there are boats docked. The, the water is shallow by boat standards, but deep by you know, comparison to a pool. And two of our three kids have passed their swimming tests. Thank you very mar- much, shark. <laughs> we keep a close eye on the third. But I'm watching the three of them as they're playing and swimming happily jumping off the dock into the water, seeing how far they dare swim before turning back to safety. And one second, they are laughing and splashing and horsing around. And then, the next second, one disappears below the surface. My heart stops, and I look, and I look, and there's a whistle and a splash and a lifeguard takes three powerful strokes, dives, and then reemerges from under the water with one of our children spluttering and g- gasping for air. Oh. I give thanks for all the lifeguards in the world right now. I give thanks for them and their good work. Our theme this morning is Rescue Me from Danger. Rescue me from danger. It's a prayerful, powerful refrain from this beloved hymn, O Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. But it is a prayer we often pray for ourselves, and sometimes we pray for our children. We pray for our loved ones. We pray for our friends. Rescue us from danger. And it's a fitting title for this passage from Matthew's Gospel. For from the perspective of Peter, our guide on this Lenten journey, this story is as much a story of rescue as it is a story of miracle. After feeding the 5,000 plus a couple thousand men and, uh, women and children, give or take, Jesus seeks out a quiet place to pray. And he bids farewell to the crowd and sends his disciples on ahead of him. They put the boats out in the water, and then Jesus goes to pray. But by the time he returns to the water's edge, the wind and the waves have pushed the boat far from the safety of the shore. If you've ever been in a small boat in open water and have drifted far from shore, when the weather turns, you know it can be a scary experience. As a teen, a friend took me out on his 20-foot sailing boat and taught me the ropes, literally. And on one occasion, it started blowing and raining, and the waves started to kick up. And I was glad to have my life jacket securely fastened. But I don't think life preservers were really a thing in the first century. And amidst the wind and the waves, the disciples are afraid. They see a figure walking to them on the water, and they hear a voice speak, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Now, the others fear a ghost, but Peter recognizes it as the voice and person of Jesus, while at the same time seeking to verify. Peter says, Lord, if it is you, it's a test. Lord, if it is you, call me to join you on the water. You know, if he had, I don't know if he really thought this through. He could have asked a number of other good security questions, like, you know, what's your mother's maiden name? What was the name of your first pet? Or what was the make and model of your first car, Jesus? He says, call me to walk with you on the water. That is a big ask. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but it doesn't say something in the Bible. Doesn't it say something in the Bible about not putting your Lord, your God, to the test? Yes? But that's exactly what Peter does. He says, in essence, if it's you, prove it to me in this especially miraculous way. So lighter than water, Jesus replies, come, come on in. The water's fine, Peter. And this is where it really gets interesting. Peter, this bold, brash disciple, swings his feet over the side of the boat puts one foot and then the other, and then makes to stand up and walk to Jesus. 
Makes you wonder, what were his motivations that day? Was he trying to prove his worthiness? Was he testing Jesus' power? Did he somehow want to reach the same level of enlightenment that Jesus had? Or was he just showing off for the guys in the boat? Look what I can do. Well, as the story goes, he stands, he walks, he makes his way to Jesus, actually walking on the waves until at some point he feels the wind. He sees the waves. And only now thinks better of his decision to leave the safety of the boat. His eyes turn from Jesus to the waters below, and he is dismayed. He begins to sink. Like Robin Williams in the movie Hook, he, when he loses his happy thought, he begins to, to sink down to the ground, lower and lower. As the water rises around him, he cries out, Save me! Save me! And the text says, Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him. Now, I told you this is, these are stories that have been uh, retold in this show called The Chosen. And this is especially well told in that series. And I like, most of all, how Jesus, the, the tone of voice that he uses as he speaks to Peter in this case, it's the, the voice of a parent reassuring a child. Did you think I would catch you? I'm here. Don't worry. Jesus says, you have a little faith. Why, why did you doubt? I mean, we've, we've probably heard that phrase before. Oh, ye of little faith. How many times have you heard that? Oh, ye of little faith. That phrase without its context can seem condemning to Peter. But Peter is not a doubter by nature. It's not his doubt that is a problem. He's actually courageous, bold, maybe overbold, overzealous in many respects. Doubt was never his real concern. But in a moment, Jesus and Peter reach the boat together. And suddenly the winds cease and all is calm. And their rescue turns to praise as they worship Jesus as the Son of God. Now careful readers of Matthew's Gospel will have known that on every Roman coin, it said Caesar, Son of God. That title is not original to the Gospel. That in the Roman times, they believed that God came down in the form of Caesar. But this cry for help, turning to deliverance, is a lesson for us. This story, um, for some commentators, this story represents places along the journey of life and faith that we all experience. Peter's journey becomes a metaphorical hero's journey, a story we all can find a reason to relate to. We can all relate to being in the boat. We can all relate to stepping out of a boat or walking on water, maybe, that feeling of exhilaration and the feeling of sinking, of needing rescue. Each of these, in some way, can encapsulate the human experience. I don't know if you remember during the pandemic in 2020, many of us were, were saying again and again, well, we're, we're all in the same boat. And then others said, no, 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 we're not in the same boat. We're in the same storm. That guy's got a yacht. I've got a leaky canoe. <laughs> but we learned that we have some commonalities. Some things look the same for us in our experiences. And the thing most of all is that we've all been in a place where we've had to pray, rescue me. God, help me. Now the boat in this metaphor represents the safe, the familiar, the sure. Spiritually, this can be a place where we feel comfortable, where we're secure within our beliefs or our community, our understanding of the divine as it's been handed down to us. There might be challenges out there, but in here, in the boat, we feel okay. As long as we stay in here, we're safe. But then at some point, we venture out of the boat, leaving the comfort and safety of what is known. We venture into the unknown, physically, spiritually, socially. This takes courage and boldness. 
It's a leap of faith to willingly leave the safe confines of the vessel and venture out into the storm. I think about people who've answered the call to step into some of the most challenging uh, fields right now. People who are signing up to be uh, nurses or work in healthcare. People who are signing up to be teachers and work in education. People signing up to be social workers, working in social services. And yes, pastors signing up to be ministers right now. Spending a day in Boise with a member in discernment, I thought, it must take a lot of courage to answer a call to ministry at a time like this. To seek ordination in a church like the UCC when you live in Idaho. Conservative state. Courage is worth celebrating. Fearlessness is commendable. Sometimes we make these big gestures. But later on we step back and we look at and we might wonder, was that the best decision? (laughs) Was I overly bold? Or was that a, a performative action? There have been times when I have taken a a step of faith and looked back later on and said, was that for me or was, was that for everybody else to see and recognize and applaud me? That's a hard thing to, to wrestle with. Sometimes we find that we are in that place where we are walking on water. Have you ever been in that place? When things are going so well that you feel like you are unsinkable, it can be exhilarating. And as leaders, especially, you have to be careful because it can go straight to our heads. It can be a danger unto itself. That's how you get that, uh, the myth of Icarus flying too close to the sun. Sometimes when we think we have godlike power, it just takes one moment to bring us back down, to remind us of our humanity. We can all probably relate to this feeling of sinking beneath the waves. We all know what it feels like to have been thrown off balance, to feel as if we are sinking. Maybe that looks like doubt or an unexpected change in our life, too busy seasons of life. Maybe it is grief or feeling that we are distanced from God. We can empathize with Peter's desperation in that moment. Because we sometimes feel like we are drowning too. The PBS NewsHour did a story the other night about loneliness in America. I don't know if any of you saw it. But it was talking about this epidemic of loneliness in our country. They were especially concerned about elders in uh, care facilities throughout the pandemic, cut off from loved ones, isolated. But they were also concerned about new parents, many who are cut off from their social networks, exhausted, unsure of what to do. They talked about Gen Z, the young people who are also feeling isolated and lonely in this media-saturated world where we don't have enough real connection. Maybe it's us who feels like we're drowning, or maybe it's someone nearby who we love and we care about, who we can see drowning, who is despairing, who's in need of rescuing. I think about the people of Palestine right now. Many who don't have enough food, water, or adequate medical care, who don't have shelter, who are living in tents. Think about Ukrainians entering the third year of war with such tremendous odds against them. In those moments, it's easy to doubt. It's easy to despair, to see only the waves and the depths around you. James Cohn in his book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, says, Suffering naturally produces doubt. How can one believe in God in the face of such horrendous suffering as slavery or segregation and the lynching tree? Under these circumstances, doubt is not a denial, but an an integral part of faith. It keeps faith from being sure of itself. 
But doubt does not have the final word. The final word is faith giving rise to hope. The hope comes in this story when Peter asks for help. He says, save me. Now, I can relate to Reverend Sarah Speed's poem as she writes, I'd rather not need rescue. I'd prefer to be able to self-rescue. Thank you. I'd follow the five-step plan. I'd find the solution myself. I can look up videos on YouTube. I can solve this problem without being vulnerable or needy or having to ask anyone else for help. Without having to face what really scares me or name it or feel it or admit that I'm not enough by myself. It feels weak to to need to ask for help, to need rescuing. I love what Nadia Boltz Weber wrote. Um, She says, There's there's not some kind of deductible on self-reliance you have to meet before your spiritual benefits kick in. You can be downright wasteful with your prayers for help. Unlike so many times in real life on the faith journey, we are free and encourage to ask for help again and again whenever we feel the need. No one's going to raise our deductible. The last part of this story that we can relate to is the catching hold of something sure. Catching hold of something we know can pull us up. The simplest and most faithful, heartfelt prayer is, save me, rescue me. And I don't know about you, but when I'm drowning, I don't want the Jesus we see on so many walls in our houses, hands folded in prayer, eyes calm, peaceful, almost sleepy. I want Baywatch Jesus. (laughs) I want David Hasselhoff sprinting through the shallows of life with a life preserver in hand, ready to pull me from the undertow. And I want Jesus, the Jesus of that song that Carol King sings with James Taylor, just call on my name, and I swear, wherever I am, I'll come running. I'll be there. The reality of life is that we will face challenges of all kinds. Emotional, relational, professional, even existential threats we see in our life. Rescue me from danger is a prayer and a plea which acknowledges the feeling of desperation, recognizes the fear that rises up when danger feels imminent, and invites us to call upon the one who can truly help. It's also a call and a prayer of solidarity for those for whom this is their only plea on your constant prayer. This story is a reminder that that faith and doubt are two things that come hand in hand. The doubt or worry or concern is a normal and natural and necessary part of a healthy spiritual life. And regardless of what boat we are in or whether we are in any boat at all, Jesus reminds us that God is with us in every storm. Peter reminds us there is more than one way to be a disciple. We don't have to have a perfect faith. It's okay to have a good enough faith. The faith is something that is always growing and evolving. What matters most is remembering that we are never alone. We can call for help when and even before we begin to sink. So today I invite you to give yourself grace to ask for help. Give yourself permission and have compassion for yourself when you are shaken by the storm. I want you to remember to call out in prayer, rescue me, rescue me, rescue me. And then look for the hand reaching out to you and know that it is the hand of Christ. Amen.